Welcome to worship this Memorial Day weekend. May the Lord touch you and move you and bless you as you open your heart to Him.
Good morning to you and welcome to La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. We are thrilled to have you worshiping with us this morning, and we hope that you are blessed by all of the elements of worship that we are about to partake in. Hey, a couple of things going on in the life of our church this week. It's as if summer has sprung. It is here. Is it normally spring that springs? Probably. But summer is here anyways. So this Wednesday, June 2nd, we have our all-church picnic at Dunsmore Park at 5.30 p.m. You bring your own dinner. We're going to hang out at the park. There will be games. There will be lots of activities. It's for the whole family. So bring everyone out June 2nd, this Wednesday, to Dunsmore Park. The next thing is the following day, June 3rd, on Thursday, we're having our summer kickoff for Abide Students. That's junior high and high school, and it will be in the Student Center from 7 to 9 p.m. It's going to be a crazy party. Our summer intern is starting, and she'll be there. We're really excited to have her, so make sure you mark the calendars, tell your junior hires and high schoolers about that event. And then lastly, on Sunday, we're having a celebration for our graduating seniors in the courtyard. That'll be at about 7 p.m. We're still finalizing the time, but we would love to have you, whether you know them or not, come and celebrate the legacy that these seniors have left on our church. We're excited to celebrate them together. Hey, at this time, we're going to ask you uh, to give uh, through offering. You can do that online, or you can do it by mailing in a check or bringing in a check here to the church office. And we give generously because we have a God who has given so, so generously to us. Would you join me in praying to that good, generous God? Our God and Father, we are so grateful for your generosity to us, for how you love us, even when we feel unlovable, even when we make it so uh, anyone else would not want to be in relationship with us, would want to be in communion with us. You pursue us. You know us deeply, God. We're thankful for your pursuit. We're thankful for how you never give up on us and for how through the relationship that you give us, we're able to have confidence. We're able to know who we are and whose we are. And we're able to walk every day with you. We ask that you would help us to do that better through this service and throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, over every enemy. Jesus for the fair, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. In his first message to the church, Peter said these words, Repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come. Well, let's turn to God now and seek his grace together. God of love, when we bow before you, we're overwhelmed by your goodness. We're also so painfully aware of our shortcomings, of our deep need for your grace and mercy. We confess to you now our lack of faith. So often we, we give in to fear. We don't trust you to take care of us. We don't live like people who share in your victory over sin and death. We confess to you our selfishness. Too often we organize our lives around worldly ambitions. We ignore the suffering of the people around us. We don't love others as you do, Lord Jesus. We confess to you our apathy and indifference. Too often we just drift along. We allow the culture around us to shape our thoughts, our choices, and our actions. We don't seek to understand your word. Our love for you is half-hearted. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. Wipe away our sin. By the power of your Spirit, give us the virtues that we need to grow in your character. Thank you, Holy God, for your grace and mercy. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Word of God. Today we honor the memory of those who died in combat defending our country. We remember with gratitude those who paid with their lives to secure our freedom. Today it's also appropriate to pray for active duty soldiers, those who are shielding us every day. America currently has about 1,800,000 military personnel worldwide. About 165,000 soldiers are currently serving in foreign countries. About 8,500 are currently on active duty in Afghanistan. Let's pray for them and let's uh, give thanks. Holy God, you have even the sparrow in your sight and you know the number of hairs on our heads. And so we pray today with the confidence that you hear us and that you care for us. We ask you to guard those who serve our nation in uniform. Protect those in Afghanistan who are facing dangers right now. Give them wisdom and courage. Help them when they're discouraged. Help us as a nation to honor and support them and their families. Today, loving Father, we remember fallen soldiers who put the welfare of others ahead of their own. Give us hearts as generous as theirs. Teach us as a country to honor their memory by defending those who are persecuted, by lifting up those who are oppressed, by building a society rooted in liberty and justice for all. Help us as a nation to shape and make a world where it will be finally possible to lay down the arms of war and turn swords into plowshares. We, and we pray today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our second scripture reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and, because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The word of our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your love for us. Lord, we thank you again for so many uh, women and men who've uh, shown us what courage looks like. Lord, we pray that you'd create, us, create in us courage, boldness. 
Lord, help us to be your people uh, in uncertain times. And Lord, let the good news come not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and full conviction. Amen. Well, some of you are traveling, uh, and that's why you're watching this. Uh, you're watching as you're traveling, and maybe you're in a hotel room, or maybe you're hanging out by the pool. Uh, but sometime during this weekend, being Memorial Day, you're probably going to see some old, either black and white or, or current movies about uh, about war, about uh, the battles that have taken place. And it's just a part of what we do. As you're uh, grabbing that hot dog, uh, you'll probably see an old war movie. Nikki and I, a few, just a few months ago, we watched Saving Private Ryan. And, and honestly, that film will be viewed, you know, thousands, maybe millions of times this weekend. And, and I am always struck by that movie. Uh, it, it's obviously a wonderful movie um, about a horrible event, right? Uh, but it was, but one of the things that always strikes me is how they ever convinced people to get in those boats. And, and, and go in the water and, and jump out of those, whatever those things are, those boats and slash cars, right? While people are shooting at them with machine guns, right? I mean, if you've seen the first few minutes of that movie, actually probably the first 30 minutes, it goes on and on, right? The, the, the bravery, the courage that it took to just get in those boats, knowing that when the, when, when that, that front went down, bullets were just going to start screaming in at you. And they just, and they, and they got out and they ran towards uh, those machine guns. And I, I thought about that courage, right? I, I thought about that, uh, that bravery that it takes to do that. And, and so many, uh, women and men are around our, our country, even now are, are, are living that life. And, that sort of courage to me just seems almost unbelievable, right? That, that kind of bravery, that, that kind of the ability to sacrifice oneself for the good of other people, right? That's, uh, that's amazing. And that, that's what we as a nation, what we as a culture celebrate today, right? We celebrate that this weekend as we, as we think about that. And, and I thought about what it would be like for us to talk about bravery on a day when we celebrate bravery, right? Because one of the things that happens when we see the, the disciples after Easter, right, they, are, they become bold, they are courageous, they are brave, they are strong, right? The disciples have, have something different has happened when the Holy Spirit comes on them, and they're able to, to do things. They're able to show bravery. They are able to show courage. They're able to give themselves up. And I began to think about my own life. And I, I, so I just want to uh, go back to some of those readings that, and just look through those briefly to think about how we might um, cultivate courage, cultivate bravery. How do we live a courageous life? There are a couple things about these two stories. There's one in Joshua chapter one, and then there's one in Acts chapter four. And they're very similar stories. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two of them, right? One of the things that is the same is that these are uncertain times. In Joshua chapter one, it says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is eight. He says, my servant Moses is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River. Moses has been the leader. In fact, he's been the only leader. This ragtag group of, of Jewish people have been wandering the wilderness. They, the only leader they've really had is Moses. Right? Aaron was sort of sometimes uh, helped out, right? But Moses was really the de facto leader. Moses was the one that God called to bring his people out of Egypt. Right. Aaron went along with him mostly because Moses said he couldn't talk very well. Right. But but ultimately, Moses was the leader. Moses was the one who went up and got the Ten Commandments. Moses was the one who spoke to God as a man speaks to his friend. Right. Moses was the leader. And now Moses is dead. You can imagine. Right. You can imagine how uncertain everyone else is, not just not just Joshua, but all the people. Right? There's uncertainty about what the future looks like. They've not, they're going to go into the promised land, and nobody knows what that looks like. Nobody knows how that's going to work out. It's, it's uncertainty. Right? The, in, in Acts chapter 4, we also see uncertainty. 
right? The, the disciples, James and John, have gone and, and they have healed a man, and this healing has caused an enormous uproar as they preach the good news of Jesus. Right, you see, James and John are also in a time of uncertainty, right? Jesus has ascended to the Father. The Holy Spirit has come down in power. They've spoken in tongues. We talked about that last week, right? But now, what does the future look like for the church, right? They, they've been told that they were going to be the witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and throughout the earth. But what does that look like? How, how's that actually going to go? Who's going to be in charge, right? The, these are times of uncertainty, and, and I think it's important as, as we get closer and closer, as, as our own sort of COVID journey is coming to a close, at least in some ways, we might wonder, what does the future look like? This, the culture has, has radically shifted, over just not just over the last year and a half, but certainly over the last year and a half. What does the future of the church look like? What does the future of our church look like? How are we going to be faithful in the years to come? There's uncertainty, right? We've never, things have never, to me, felt more uncertain. And yet here we are being called to be brave. And so I want us to think about what, it, what would it mean to, to be bold, right? What does God say to Joshua? He says, remember, my servant Moses is dead. You're the leader now. You are the one who's going to lead. And so what does he say? What does God say to him? Be strong and courageous. In verse 6. In verse 7, he says, be strong and very courageous. At the end of uh, chapter, uh, it, it, as we move on in chapter 1, he says this, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, uh, but be strong and courageous. He says it multiple times. God says you need to be strong and you need to be courageous. Actually, the, word, the Hebrew words both kind of mean strong. They mean strong and firm. You know, a person who's able to, to do what God has called him to do. You need to be strong. You need to be bold. You need to be courageous. When the disciple, when the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, when they see Jesus' disciples, right in Acts chapter four, what does it say? What does it say? It says, "When they saw the courage of Peter and John, right the, these these were bold guys. They were doing powerful things. They were strong and courageous. So, what would it mean for us as a church to be strong and courageous? How do we face this uncertainty?" Well, I want us to think there are a couple things, and as, as always, there are three, right? Not always, but almost always. There are three, right? Because preachers like threes, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our goals right. That's the number one. Or we might say it this way. We're going to align our purposes with God's purpose. We're going to align our will with God's will. Now, this is a really important thing, Um that we see here, because one of the problems we have with courage, with, with boldness, is very often we don't really know what to do. So it's hard to know how to be bold. It's hard to know how to be courageous when you're not sure what the goal is, right? When the goal is sort of fuzzy, right? How do you storm that beach if you don't know where the beach is? And not only that, but we don't know what the ultimate goal of it is, right? How are we to be bold well, the Bible says we need to align our goals with God's goals. And, and the Bible says this. It's a very interesting thing. And, and I want you to, to sort of meditate on this because it's easy to miss this. I want you to see what he says to Joshua. He says, Joshua, he says, I want you to know that I have promised to give this land to the people of Israel. I, that's what God says. I promised to it. I swore to their fathers, to their ancestors, that I was going to give it to them. And I'm giving it to them. What does he say in verse uh, 6? He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. I'm giving them the land. Now get busy, Joshua. Now think about what he's saying. And this is actually not uncommon at all. When God speaks to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, he says, the prayers of the people of Israel, their groaning has come up before me, and I've decided to act. I remembered my covenant with Abraham, and I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to free them from the people of Israel. Now, Moses, you get up and you go do it. And to Joshua, he says, Joshua, I've promised to give the land to the people of Israel. This is what I swore to do. Now, Joshua, get up and go do it. And I love what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 28. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And we say, oh, thank you, Lord. And then what does Jesus say? Now get to work. 
And I, sometimes I want to say, wait, 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 wait. If, if you have all the authority, God, if you have all the power, God, if you're freeing the people of Israel from Egypt, God, if you're giving the land, why don't you do it? And that's the thing. God says, no, no, no. I want you to align your purposes with me. God says, I have plans for this world. And then he looks at his people and says, now get to work. You are the ones I've chosen to carry out my plan. You see, I think boldness, courage comes from the fact that we know that we have been called to a, to a cosmic duty, right? We have been called to, to be a part of God's blessing of the entire universe, right? We've been uh, called to be the people through whom God is going to repair this broken world. Right, of course, Jesus, his death and burial and resurrection, that's what achieves that. But then he calls us to carry that out. God says, I'm the one who's freeing the people from the land of Egypt. But Moses, you're the one who's going to go. Joshua, I'm the one who's going to give the people of Israel this land. But you're the one who's going to lead them there. To his disciples, he says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, but I want you to go and make disciples. Right, we have to. What part of this is learning to align our plans with God's plans? Right, because everything we know about neuroscience, everything we know about habits, everything we know about life is that our purposes, our goals dictate how we live in the world. And so, I think what we need to do as Christians, what I need to do particularly, is as I'm living my life, as I'm going through my day, I really need to always keep front and center what my goals actually are. Because, a lot, because in the United States, we have a lot of different goals, right? We have, we have the American dream. We have this idea that we should have life and liberty and happiness, right? We very often mix up God's goals with our goals, right? We all very often say, God, my goal is to be happy. My goal is to retire early. My goal is to, uh, you know, to do what, to do all of these things, to build a great business, to, to magnify, you know, my name in the world, right? Like, like we get our goals and we say, that's what my goal is. And then we just assume that that's what God's goal is for us. But what does God say? He says, no, 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 I've got goals. God says, I have goals and they involve the redemption of the whole universe. They involve, right, Jesus recreating in Revelation, at the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 21, Jesus says this, behold, I'm making all things new. I'm restoring this universe. And God has called us to be his people that do that. Right, God is doing it, but we've called to do, we've been called to do that. And so we have to reorient our thinking. We have to recalibrate our hearts. We have to realign our plans with God's plans. Right? You can imagine that, right? When the soldiers were storming the beaches of Normandy, each one of them didn't say, you know what? I have a different goal, right? I, I've got a goal. Maybe my goal is to make friends, you know, with those people that are shooting at us, right? Maybe that's what we should do. We should make friends with them. Right. Or I know we'll have a, we'll have a round table talk right now. There were, there was one goal and it was given to the, <laughs> to the soldiers. And they said, you carry out our goal. This will bring liberation. Right. That's what they said. God says to us, I've got plans. Now, granted, they're not like the storm, the storming be of the beaches of Normandy. Right. That's not what God's plan is. But they're, but, but God has given us a plan. And it's to align our purposes with his. Now, the thing you might ask is, and this is our second one, how do we know what God's plan is? How do we know what God's plan is? I mean, we're to be bold and we're to be brave, but how do we know that our bold and brave isn't just recklessness, right? How do we know that we're not just not storming the beaches and getting shot at for no good reason? How do we know what God's plan is? Well, Joshua tells us that too, or God tells Joshua that. He says this, be strong and very courageous, Joshua. Then he says this in verse seven, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, uh, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. 
Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. So there are two key things, right? He says, you must keep this book of the law in your mouth at all time. Don't do, make sure you do everything in it. Right? What is God saying? He says, I, you're, the way you will know what your purpose is, the way you will know what to uh, do and what to ha- where to, in fact, what we, we might say this way, what hills do I die on? Right? Well, how do I discern the truth? We keep God's word always in our hearts. Right? What he's talking about, I believe, is character formation. In fact, you can see it maybe even a little more clearly in the, in the book of Acts, in that story about, remember, Jane, uh, Peter and John. And it says in verse 13, right, Jesus, Peter and John have been told, they've, been, they've spent the night in jail after healing this man in the name of Jesus and then preaching about the good news of Jesus. In verse 13, it says this, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, That word ordinary is the Greek word that we get our word idiot from. Now, it doesn't mean idiot, I promise. That's not what it means. But it does mean ordinary, right? It means somebody who's not not an expert, right? He says, when they saw that these guys were just just nobodies, right? Ordinary people, not, not special people like us, right? When they saw that they were unschooled, ordinary men, listen to what it says. They were astonished and they realized that these men had been with Jesus, right? What happened? You see, Jesus had trained them. The the, the, uh, Sanhedrin and the the Sadducees, they were the the educated elite, right? They were the ones who who had been to seminary. They were the ones who'd studied, and Jesus' disciples were just, well, not that. They were not experts. They were just fishermen. And yet they had been to school with Jesus and they could tell they had been to school with Jesus. Look look at what he says in, uh, Joshua says, right? God says to Joshua, he says, keep this book of the law on on your heart, right? Keep it in your mouth, meditate on it day and night. See what God is talking about is he's talking about character formation, Right, he says, don't, 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 don't even let a little bit of it slip. Don't even, don't even go. Well, this is the really important parts, and I'll do that. But the little parts, no, nah, nah, that's not so important. No, he says, do it all. Keep it all there. Be careful to do it all. Right? Jesus had been with his disciples, and he, he. And have you ever noticed? Somebody asked me uh, in an email a few weeks ago. They said, Lee, if all of the disciples were asleep, how did they know what Jesus was praying about? Well, one of them must have been awake, right? I assume, right? The thing about it is, is that Jesus let them into his intimate prayer life with God. He trained them. He taught them how to read the Bible, right? The the disciples quote the Bible back to the Sanhedrin, right? They quote them back to to the teachers and the scribes, right? See, Jesus had taught his disciples how to read the Bible. He taught them how to pray. He taught them how to live. He taught them how to, he formed their character. He poured his life into them. And by the time they got to the book of Acts, their character had been shaped and formed. They saw how Jesus suffered. They saw how he lived. They saw how he fasted. They saw how he prayed. They saw how he disciplined himself. They saw his character and his character began, uh, eventually became their character. And when the, when the Sanhedrin and the, and the people saw them, they said, these people look a lot like Jesus because their character had been formed. You see, we, one of the things that we as, as Americans and, and that we've lost is this idea that character is the most foundational thing in our lives, our character, our habits, our choices, who we are is so important. And what the Bible tells us is that needs to be shaped. That needs to be molded. Character doesn't just happen. It needs to be shaped and it needs to be molded. I want to tell you about my friend, Bob Kiter. He's one of my favorite people. And the Kiters are my adoptive family here in California. They are known to take in strays. Right, and Bob is a Marine. He was uh, he 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 fought in uh, Korea in the Korean conflict, 
and he was wounded, right? And, and he was left for dead. And, and it really probably should have died, except it was so cold, he said that his, the blood froze, which kept him from bleeding to death. And later, and, and he spent a whole night on the ground, wounded. Um, finally, the corpsman came and put him on a stretcher, and they found out that he was still alive. They thought he was dead. They took him to a hospital, and I, I, he spent six months having to relearn how to walk and do all the things that happened. And, and he, he just he showed just such bravery in that. And, but not only that, but one of the things that's fascinating is not just Bob's war stories. And how, and, and just the, the bravery with which he lived his life. But when he got back to the United States and he got married, he began to live his life like everybody else. And one of the things that, ha that Bob did was he, he was a scoutmaster, and his troop, while most of the other uh, Cub, uh, Boy Scout troops in the United States were still segregated, Bob led the first integrated troop in all of Ohio. See, Bob's character had been shaped. He told me about, I asked him one time, how did you, when bullets were flying, and there were a lot of bullets, I said, when the bullets were flying, how did you, not, how did you know what to do? And then he told me kind of a long story about boot camp and about the training that he had received and about how all of the, the things work on small groups and how you practice formations with your group and you did it until you could do it in your sleep. And he said, because when the bullets start flying, your training takes over. And it got me to thinking about our character formation. You see, the reason why I think God tells Joshua and, God, and, and why Jesus discipled his, he trained his disciples. He said that when, when the heat is on, when the pressure is on, your training takes over. God says to Joshua, don't let this word out of your mouth. Meditate on it. Meditate on it day and night because there's going to be times when the pressure's on and you're going to need your training to take over. Your character takes over. Right? When, the, when, the, when things are difficult, when, 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 things, when the world doesn't seem right, when everything's uncertain, what happens is our character takes over. And I'm going to tell you the truth. There have been times in my life when I let my character slip, right? When little white lies, well, that's just a little white lie. That's, a, that's not going to hurt anybody. In fact, it'll just save everybody pain. Let's just, this little thing, well, you know, I've worked hard. I've earned this little thing over here. You know, just a little, it's a little sin. It's really not going to hurt anybody because it's just a little bitty sin. No, but it, it, it's almost, I, I, even God will be okay with it. Right, but see, the little things add up to big things, don't they? Our character is shaped by the little decisions in our life. Jesus knew it, and that's why he trained his disciples. So when the, when the pressure was on, when the, when, the, when the Sanhedrin looked at the disciples and said, you shall not preach in the name of Jesus, right? We want you to no more talk about this Jesus. We want you to keep your mouth shut. We want you to be quiet about what Jesus has done. You just mind your own business. This is what they say. They called them in again and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. This is Acts chapter 4, verse 18. In verse 19, he says, But Peter and John replied, You tell us what's right in God's eyes. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. So you be the judge. Which is right? Should we do what you say or what God says? You see, the reason why they were able to say that is because Jesus had trained them. He had drilled them. He had built their character. He had shaped and molded their character so much that everybody that saw them looked at them and said, wow, they've been with Jesus. Now, I think the last thing that we, and, and maybe the most important thing, Right, character is certainly important, but I think this may be even more important than character is the realization and the reality that God is with us. Look at what God says to Joshua. Right, he says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. 
Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God, he, uh, God is telling him, he says, um, I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. God is with you. You see, that's what the Sanhedrin saw. They looked at them and they said, Jesus has been with those people. Right? Jesus has been with them. God is with you. Right? He says, I will not fail you. Verse 5, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, uh, God says this, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. Remember I told you that character is important? Our character is certainly important. God is working on us to, to uh, form and mold our character but the truth is God's character is what's most important. God's character is what's most important. God says, I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never fail you. You can, hold, you can, you can trust my character is what God says. But Jesus says something very similar, right? Matthew 28. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. And then at the last verse, he says this, but don't forget, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The God who never changes, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You see, our bravery, our courage, is based on God's character. It's based on who He is. Now, what God, of course, God wants to form our character so that our character looks like His character. But it all goes back to Him. It all goes back to the God who loves us and gave Himself for us. It comes from the fact that God wasn't content to, to be far off from us. But even while we were his enemies, Paul says, God, Jesus came and he died for us. Because God is with us. His character shapes everything. I told you about Bob for my birthday a few years back. Uh, he gave me a compass that I keep on my bedside table. And the compass comes uh, and written, inscribed on the compass uh, is Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Right? And it's on a compass, right? You see, my character, God's character is my compass. In the midst of uncertainty, it's his character I rely on. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your son, Jesus, who showed us not only what it means to live, but gave us the power through his death, burial, and resurrection to live this life. Lord, we pray that you would form our character, that you would align our will with your will and teach us to trust in you. And all God's people said, amen. We are grateful you've joined us in worship this morning. We're also especially grateful this weekend as our country remembers those who have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our cherished freedoms. If you're able, we'd love to see you in person next Sunday as we gather in the sanctuary for worship at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.